Michigan, Mr. Blazier. People represented by Mr. Darden and Mr. Kelberg and Mr. Lynch. Jury is not present. Good morning, Council. Anything we need to uh, take up before we uh, invite the jurors to join us? Yes, sir. I want to matter of court business. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Cochran. Your Honor uh, will recall that we had previously filed a motion uh, with regard to the jury and whether or not certain jurors were targeted. I think that uh, given the recent uh, circumstances, we would like to have that motion uh, set uh, for hearing. And I wanted to ask the court to set it as soon as possible, or at least let's talk about some dates uh, given our upcoming schedule. All right, how about, how about the afternoon, June 16th? Um, Your Honor, that might, may I, may I confer just a second, Your Honor? Sorry. Right. You know, what I was going to suggest, uh, we would like to have that motion heard as absolutely as soon as possible. If uh, we're to be dark on Monday, if uh, the coroner's still on the stand, uh, we'd be willing to do it as early as the 12th. And I, I think Mr. Dershowitz will be coming out also for that motion, so that um, we'd like the earliest possible date, uh, if you can do it next week. And we understand with our increased schedule, it'll be tough. We don't want to set it, of course, at 5 o'clock, because we want to give adequate time to it, of course. So That's why I'm yeah. suggesting the afternoon of uh, June the 16th. All right. Uh, we want to do it as soon as possible. If something breaks loose earlier and we get an afternoon, would the court consider that? I'll consider that, certainly. All right. So I'd have to give Dershowitz some lead time, of course, to get here. All right. Well, uh, why don't we <coughs> schedule it for the 16th, but you have to understand I have a 1026 hearing also set for that afternoon. Yes. This isn't the only case I'm yes, doing. Yes, no, I understand. I understand. Do you have any other cases, Your Honor? Yes, I do. I used to also, Your Honor. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, thank you, Your Honor. I've been the 16th, and perhaps we can move it up if at all possible. All right. Thank you very kindly. Uh, Mr. Darden, any comment on that scheduling? All right. Thank you, sir. Ms. Sager. Good morning. I apologize for taking up the court's time with what may or may not be an issue, um, but was unable to find out precisely what the court was intending to do with respect to the uh, introduction and viewing of the autopsy photos. I understand that that procedure may occur today, and we were hearing from individuals through the prosecution's office that the photos will not be shown to the spectators in the courtroom and may or may not be made available for anyone to see. And obviously that was a great concern to my clients who understandably feel that they have a right to see information that's being introduced into evidence and that it's critical to them being able to accurately report on what the witnesses are testifying about. But don't you already have access to the complete coroner's protocol, the addenda, all the charts and all the descriptions? I mean, don't you already have that? We asked for and received, as, as Your Honor knows, a copy of the coroner's records, but not the photographs. Uh, were not asked for at the time the Public Records Act request was made because we were not seeking to simply view photographs or any kind of prurient interest, but there is an interest in seeing photographs that the court has determined should be introduced or may be introduced as evidence before the jury because they do have some particular relevance in proving a portion of the prosecution's case. So while my clients were more than willing to limit their requests for the coroner's records to not include photographs because they weren't seeking to simply look at them for the sake of looking at them, they are interested in viewing the photographs that the prosecution has decided and the court has acquiesced in their, their argument um, are necessary for them to prove their case to the jury. And those are the photographs, only the ones that are being introduced into evidence that are being shown to witnesses for testimony that the media feel that they have a right and, and indeed it's necessary for them to see in order to accurately report on what the witnesses are testifying about and the jury is seeing. Ms. Sager, the, the, the difficulty that I have with this is that have to also take into consideration the feelings of the victim's families and what little dignity is left that we can accord to the victims themselves. 
and to display them publicly in such a manner is, is highly distasteful to me personally. And I can understand that, Your Honor, and we're not asking for the opportunity to copy or reproduce or broadcast or otherwise show the photographs publicly. Um, none of the clients I represent are asking for that. Uh, they're simply asking for an opportunity to view what the jury will see and must see, as I understand it, based on the court's order, in order for them to understand what the prosecution's evidence is in this case and to make a fair and just determination. And while I, I certainly understand the reluctance of the victim's families to see the photos and would not, I mean, they certainly can, can choose not to see the photos. And I understand the court's reluctance in having the photos disseminated beyond the courtroom and would not ask the court to do that. I do think that it, it is not only required as a matter of constitutional law, but is critical to the public's understanding of the case and of this court's decision that those photographs will be shown to the jury for the media to also see, or members of the public who are uh, chosen to spectate uh, in the courtroom, be also able to see the photographs because that's critical to this court's determination. Obviously, the court would not have made a ruling on their admissibility without having looked at the photographs, nor could anyone evaluating the court's decision come to any conclusion about whether the jury should see the photographs, what impact that might have on the jury, whether the jury reaches a fair and just determination at the conclusion of these proceedings without seeing what the jury sees. The and only I, people who need to see it for that purpose of the Court of Appeal would be the Court of Appeal. Well, I disagree, Your Honor. If that were the case, all proceedings could be closed and, and the Court of Appeal could simply determine whether or not a trial had reached a just result. But that's not what the Supreme Court has said. It's said that the public has a right of access, and one of the reasons for that is so the public can feel that a fair result has been reached so that they can understand what the proceedings are all about and they can evaluate for themselves what the evidence is that the jury is seeing. But to follow that line of argument, then I should also display all the photographs that the prosecution has chosen not to offer and the photographs that I've dictated should not be presented to the jury. No, Your Honor, I think there's an easy distinction to make there because those photographs are something the jury will never see. The jury will never make a determination as to guilt or innocence based on material that's not before them. And while things that the court has excluded may well wind up being issues in the Court of Appeal or become part of the record in that, um, the fact that we're not asking to see photographs that the court has excluded, I don't think changes the public's right to see evidence that's actually introduced. And I'd remind the court that when this issue arose last summer in the preliminary hearing and we asked to see certain crime scene photos, and at that point I don't think the autopsy photos were even introduced, but crime scene photos were, the court and the prosecution both took the same position, that there is a distinction when things are introduced at evidence at trial, it becomes a totally different issue. And at that point there is a public right of access that overcomes any interest in privacy or concern, excuse me, concerns that the court had at that time about allowing the press to even view the photographs. And the court explicitly said in its order at that time that the photographs that the court then said that the press was not able to excuse view. Me a <clears throat> Ms. Sager that the photographs that the press at that time was not permitted to view would become public and public for them to see and the public to see at the time they were introduced into evidence before the jury. How would you recommend I do this? Well, Your Honor, obviously the, the people that I represent would prefer that they be given contemporaneous access so that they could see the photographs while the witnesses were testifying. Um, I understand that there may be concerns that the victim's families who want to be present may not want them shown in a way that they would have to see them. They obviously could choose to avert their eyes or to not be present in the courtroom when the photos are being shown, and I understand that issue has come up with respect to Mr. Simpson as well. Um, the court could make other arrangements for the viewing of the photos, but if they're not to be shown contemporaneously, which I think <clears throat> is important so that people reporting on the case have the information that the witness and the jury has, then I'd ask that it be done at the earliest possible time after a particular photograph is introduced into evidence and not simply wait until the end of the proceedings or the end of a witness's testimony. Well, the problem is the procedure normally followed in criminal prosecutions is at the conclusion of the prosecution's case, they will offer into evidence the exhibits that they have marked for identification purposes. I think we perhaps have only out of the 200 or so prosecution exhibits that have been marked so far, I think only maybe five have been offered in the evidence at this point. 
So well, by your definition, then these will not be in evidence. But they will be shown, as I understand it, to the jury. That's correct. And they will be shown to the witness. And anything that the jury is being shown, I think the public has an equal right to see. Because that is in, inarguably going to be part of what the jury considers when they make up their minds at the end of this case. And once the jury is shown the photos, as opposed to the court reviewing them in camera or the party seeing them in discovery, once the jury and the witnesses are seeing those photos, then I think the public and the press have a right to see them as well so that they can understand what the testimony is that's being given and what the jury is, is being told contemporaneously with those proceedings occurring. All right, Mr. Cochran, any comment on behalf of Mr. Simpson? Yes, Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. Sir. Your Honor, uh, the defense is um, vehemently opposed to the public or anyone else seeing these photographs. I spoke with Ms. Clark. Um, as we heard Ms. Sager's motion, as Ms. Sager always argues eloquently, but in this instance, I think you put, a, put your finger upon it from a standpoint of the public's right to know. And uh, in this matter, we argued this earlier. We fashioned a compromise where the uh, autopsy protocols were released. They have those already, and there are diagrams in that, and that's, that, that seems to me to be entirely appropriate. For these photographs to be uh, displayed publicly, uh, I think is, is offensive to the victims, offensive to the defendant, and offensive to, to families on both sides. Uh, it serves no purpose, and I think it's entirely uh, inappropriate. We feel very, very strongly about that, and we urge the court. As I understand, the court has fashioned um, the court's reasoning in allowing the photographs was because of a theory of the prosecution to show certain aspects of this case. Uh, they can hear that, but to have these photographs shown to the public, to have these photographs become part of the public domain so they're going to be in these tabloid shows is, is outrageous. Uh, there's been enough of a circus atmosphere created in this case, and I think that this is one time both sides agree that we have to draw the line uh, for the victims, for Mr. Simpson's family, for Mr. Simpson's children, for everyone. Enough is enough. Uh, the camera's here all the time with us, and that's enough, Your Honor. And I think, and, and based upon decency uh, and the fact that uh, it would just be outrageous to do that. And I think that, uh, as it is, we're worried about these pictures being uh, some tabloid magazine stealing the pictures or whatever and having them displayed now. Uh, it would just be outrageous. The court yourself has said these photographs are so disturbing, uh, so disturbing the jurors may not even want to see them. But for the limited purpose you're allowing that, certainly it's not going to, uh, it's, it should not be part of the public domain. I think we all agree with that. And I would ask that the only the photographs be set up in such a way that only the jurors are able to see them. They put up there, taken down as soon as possible, and we move off from this part of the case. All right. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Kelber. Mr. Kelbert. Unfortunately, there is a difference sometimes between one's personal feelings of what should be done and one's sense of what the Constitution may provide, which may not be the wisest thing necessarily, but may be the law. And in talking with Ms. Clark, and uh, she was my emissary in talking with Mr. Cochran, um, I share everyone's concern about the privacy rights of these families, the families that are here in court, uh, the families that may not be here in court but have an interest in these proceedings. And I speak on behalf of the Goldmans and the Browns, and I join in Mr. Cochran's concerns for Mr. Simpson's family as well. These photographs have significant probative value from our perspective and must be shown to the jury. Does the Constitution require that the public's right of access be absolutely equal to every aspect of information that is given the jury? Or is the public's right to know satisfied by the fact that we allow the press to sit in on these proceedings and hear everything that's going on? record whatever testimony they seek to record in their pads and get uh, transcripts and uh, quote accurately, we hope, in their press uh, releases. And then let the public find from that information what they seek to find. But if the public is merely a voyeur looking for the titillating aspect of autopsy photos, the public has no right to know and no right of access in my judgment. And on that basis, Your Honor, uh, I believe that if there is to be any so-called public access, unquote, that the access should be satisfied by the court 
making available for inspection in a closed courtroom to representatives of the press, since obviously the public that apparently is clamoring for this case can't all fit in this courtroom, so obviously representatives of the press have to act as the eyes and ears to some degree of the public, even though the public can watch by the cameras that are here in the courtroom, and let representatives of the media view these boards at the completion, perhaps, of the day, if any board is used, and obviously with no right to photograph, no right to photocopy, that the boards are to remain sealed, absent further order of the court, from viewing by anyone other than the lawyers in the case or the jurors. If the court feels that there is any right of access, I believe that that will satisfy that right of access. Personally, I am completely opposed to anyone other than these members of the jury seeing these photographs. These photographs are powerful, and we believe they're powerful evidence to prove guilt. But they are powerful in a sense that's much more important, I think, morally, when this court has to decide whether these victims must be once again brought into the public eye in the worst possible way imaginable by having their bodies viewed from photographs taken at the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office. So as much as personally I may be opposed to this, constitutionally there may well be some right of access, but if there is, I believe this court can limit it in the tightest fashion possible to having representatives. Not every news media that wants to see it, representative news media have an opportunity to view the boards under what I would call controlled circumstances where we are certain that they have a chance to view them, adequate time to view them, but that nothing further can be done to these boards as far as photographing, copying, et cetera, and that they otherwise remain sealed. On that basis, I will submit the matter, Your Honor. Right. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Briefly. The, the thing I would indicate is you can see the people's position is very close to the position of the defense. And the one thing, Mr. Mr. Kilberg was not here at the time, that you fashioned um, this um, procedure by which the, the protocol was released with the diagrams and pretty much the entire thing. So the, the press has that already. And it seems to me that that's sufficient, Your Honor. So I would not even allow, even in a closed setting, the release. That's how these leaks and things occur. And I think the court knows that. So I think that, uh, again, uh, I think the court uh, is on sound ground here. Um, you've been reasonable in this regard. We have argued against any release of these photographs. And I think that, uh, I think what you're going to find, I'm not here to argue uh, uh, against what Mr. T um, Kelberg has said, but I just think that it would be inappropriate, even in a close setting, to do this. I think that it has to do with the victims and the families of the victims and everyone who's in this. this is a very sensitive part of the case, and I'd ask the court to consider that as you've indicated. All right. Thank you, Counsel. Very briefly. Briefly. The court is aware there will be two exhibits probably marked today, certainly one of them, and the other will be marked tomorrow if we don't get to it today, which will be what I'll describe as wound charts that describe Dr. Lakshmanan's observations with respect to each of the photographs which are going to be viewed by the jury. Now, I believe that Dr. Lakshmanan's expertise permits him to accurately see what is in these photographs far better than any representative from the news media ever could by observing the actual photographs. And I believe that, in fact, we can satisfy uh, Mr. Cochran's concerns, the prosecution's concerns, the concerns of the family by making available to the press Today should be very easily done because we have extra copies of these uh, documents, these exhibits. And the best that the press is going to be able to do anyway is look at these photographs and try and write down descriptions. These documents will provide detailed descriptions of each injury that's seen in each photograph and will even help the press out by, in the form, showing where there's a reference in the protocol, a reference in the diagram, a reference in the addendum to the particular injury. What more could they do? They just have to write the story. We give them all the information. There is nothing that the photographs will provide them that is not in either of these two charts. And that, I believe, is better than they could ever hope to have. I'll submit the matter. Thank you, Counselor. Briefly. Briefly. 
I just want to reiterate because Mr. Cochran no, seems it, to misunderstand. No, no, you don't need to reiterate anything <coughs> for the argument. That we're not asking for display or copying outside of the courtroom. But I'm not aware of any authority, and, and neither side apparently has cited, e either party has apparently cited any either, that permits effectively the sealing of exhibits because other information in the courtroom is good enough, they think, for the media because documents are graphic or disturbing or horrible as the court has described them or because there are privacy interests of the families or concerns of the families. I'm not aware of any authority that supports not permitting the public and press access to materials that are going on in a public trial, in a public forum, for any of those reasons. And instead, the Supreme Court in every instance has said there is a constitutional right of access which extends to documents that are used and shown to the jury. And while I agree with all of the personal concerns of the parties in the court, none of those, I think, have any constitutional grounds for denying the public and press access to materials that are shown to the jury. And I would urge the court to fashion the narrowest possible order if there's any restrictions placed on the access. And I've suggested the narrowest possible order that we're not asking for copies or reproductions or broadcast, but simply for an opportunity to see what the jury is seeing. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. I'll think about it. All right, Deputy McNair, let's have the jurors, please. Uh, did you want to address the issue of uh, Mr. Simpson's presence during the testimony? Uh, I had a conference with Mr. Uh, Kelberg and Mr. Cochran uh, earlier today. I'll confer with Mr. Kelberg. Thank you. And I think we reached an agreement as to how that might be addressed should the occasion arise. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. All right. been rejoined by all the remaining members of our jury panel. Mrs. Robertson, would you please draw the uh, numbers of two alternates? First for uh, seat number two. Seat number two, juror 1492. And for seat number 10. Seat number 10, juror 2179. All right, Dr. Uh, Lakshmanan, would you uh, resume the witness stand, please? All right, good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Your Honor. Doctor, you're reminded, sir, you are still under oath. Mr. Kelberg, you may continue with your direct examination. And let me ask Mr. Bancroft, you're directed not to attempt to uh, train the television camera on any photographic depiction of any of the victims or any of their body parts. Same direction to the still photographers. All right, Mr. Kelberg, let's proceed. Thank you, Your Honor, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Dr. Lakshman, and uh, when we were last in court on Friday, I had shown you a photograph 
that depicted a scale and the uh, measuring device used to measure the heights and the scale to measure the weights of the decedents uh, as they arrive at the coroner's office. And we printed out that photograph, but I don't believe, Your Honor, for the record that I formally marked it. It is Exhibit 299 for identification. Right, so much. And, Your Honor, the court may recall that uh, at the completion of Friday's testimony with the Form 1s, which have been marked 298A and B, there was some identifying information on uh, family addresses for the victims, which, by agreement with counsel, could be whited out, uh, and the whited out documents substituted in their stead. And that is what Mr. Fairlow has very competently done, and I would ask that they be marked uh, as they previously were, but in the whited out condition, 298 A and B. All right, so ordered. And with that, I'll turn these back to your clerk. taking, uh, in essence, a tour of the coroner's office with respect to the procedures used once the bodies, in this case of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman, arrive. And we're waiting for our laser disc to arrive, so we have to go to a somewhat more old-fashioned way of uh, continuing the tour. You had stopped at the area where the bodies were weighed and measured, and now, Your Honor, uh, we have another photograph which I'm asking Mr. Fairtlow to place on the Elmo. And which, when it's printed out, Your Honor, I would ask to be marked as Exhibit 300. All right, People's 300. <coughs> Doctor, uh, what is depicted in this particular photograph, Exhibit 300? This is the reception area uh, in the same room where the weighing scale and measuring device were present. It's on the other side of the room. What is to be done at this location once the bodies have been weighed and measured? Uh, we usually, uh, this is the area where the uh, uh, crypt space and body control cards are kept. That is, we have uh, uh, information on where the bodies are located in the department in the crypt space. Crypt spaces are specific locations for yes. specific bodies? that's correct. And these two gentlemen that appear in this photograph, 300, are these people who are responsible for giving the assigned spaces? They are the employees responsible at that time. Incidentally, doctor, when the investigator goes to the scene to uh, take custody of the bodies, is the investigator given an individualized number that will be applied for each case? Yes. Uh, we start with the number one for each year, and depending on the case number for that particular day, that's a case number assigned to a particular <coughs> dissident, and the investigator puts a band on the body. The band is placed on the body at the scene where the body is taken? Yes. And in this particular case, was an individualized number given for the body of Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. What number was that? 94 5136. 5136? Yes. And the 94 refers to the year of 1994? Yes. And was an individualized number given for the body of Mr. Goldman? Yes. What number was that? 94-5135. Again, a tag placed around his uh, ankle area? Yes. Is there anything further uh, that you need to describe from this particular photograph, 300? No. And if I can exchange with Mr. Fairtlow, Another photograph that I asked the court to mark when it's printed out as Exhibit 301. All right, People's 301. Doctor, what are we looking at in this photograph? Uh, that is a rack uh, where you have uh, the location of all the cards with reference to all the dissidents in the office on, uh, on a particular day. When you say rack with all the cards, what are these cards to reflect? They're the body control cards uh, and the uh, tags which refer to which crypt space a particular dissident is located in. Which crypt space, if you know, was assigned for the body of Nicole Brown Simpson? Uh, I think it was number four. I'll just... Uh, you, you have a series of uh, materials in front of you that appear to be in two big binders. What are those materials, doctor? These are the case records of uh, both the dissidents as, as filed in the coroner's department. Is there a document you can refer to that will refresh your recollection as to the specific crypt assignments? Yes, and Form 1 should show it. Okay, that would be our 298A and B forms that we yes. were looking at? 
basically they had numbers three and four assigned to them. Crips three and four? Yes. And in fact, is there some kind of impression, inked impression that is placed on the record that reflects the crypt assignment for each of the bodies? Yes. <coughs> is there anything further in this photograph, 301, that is of significance in the process of the handling of these bodies? Uh, no. I have another photograph, which I'm handing to Mr. Ferretlow and ask your honor that it be marked as exhibit 302. All right, people's 302. Doctor, and incidentally, doctor, when you're going to speak, if you'll be sure you turn this way towards the microphone, I think it'll help. I know it's tough to look and speak uh, at the same time, but uh, if you'll be sure you speak outward, it'll be helpful to everybody. What are we looking at in this photograph? This is the area where every dissident is uh, photographed as soon as they come to the coroner's office. So we have a picture uh, of their appearance when initially brought to the coroner's office. What is the purpose of taking a photograph of the body as the body initially arrives at the coroner's office? So we have some uh, information on uh, the condition of the body. Uh, number two, also it's a kind of identification type of photograph. In this photograph, doctor, is the camera that was, uh, first of all, was there a camera on June 13, 1994? Yes, there was. In this photograph, is there a camera? No camera present. Why is there no camera in this photograph? Because the camera had some problems because the photographs were getting jammed and we have ordered a new camera now. So you're still waiting for that camera to come? Yes. Doctor, were photographs taken of the bodies of Nicole Brown Simpson and Mr. Goldman when they arrived on June 13, 1994? Yes. Was there anything unusual about the pictures that were taken by the camera in place at that time? Yeah, there was a malfunction of the camera, and we had super uh, imposition of the photographs of both the dissidents. So they were not very uh, useful. When you say superimposed, in other words, one exposure on top of another? Uh, partially, and uh, there was jamming in the camera film uh, movement. You do have those pictures, uh, whatever their condition may be. I'm not asking you to show them, but I just want to be sure. You do have those pictures that were taken by that camera? Yes, I have copies of them. Uh, doctor, is there anything else that takes place with respect to photography in this area that's shown in this particular photograph? No. I think we're on to the next photograph, which I believe, Your Honor, is then 303? 303. What are we looking at in this photograph, 303, Doctor? This is uh, uh, the area called the dissident processing room, where fingerprints are uh, uh, performed, uh, evidence is collected, and uh, this is a portion of the room. What kind of evidence is collected in this particular area besides having fingerprints taken? Uh, usually hair evidence is collected, fingernail clippings can be done, fingernail scrapings, etc. The hair that you're talking about comes from various areas of each decedent's body? Yes. Whose responsibility is it to take those samples? It could be the uh, forensic uh, attendant, or the investigator or the criminalist who is uh, doing the examination and collection of evidence. In the case of Ms. Brown Simpson, was a collection of reference hair samples taken? Yes. In the case of Mr. Goldman, was a reference sample of hair taken? Yes. With respect to fingernail scrapings and clippings, were representative samples taken from Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. Who had done all of these things, starting with the hair, through the clippings and scrapings of Ms. Brown Simpson? Ms. Claudine Ratcliffe. And she was the investigator? Yes. Was uh, a collection of scrapings and clippings from Mr. Goldman taken? No. Why not? Uh, her explanation was that there was, the nails were too short to do clippings, and they did not do any nail scrapings. 
Your Honor, I have another photograph to exchange uh, with the one Mr. Fertlow has up to, and ask that it be marked as exhibit. Oh, I'm saved. I don't have to fumble anymore. We have our laser, for the record, we have our laser disc back. And it's number 14. And again, Your Honor, that when this is printed out, it'd be exhibit 304, I believe? Yes. And I don't know if Mr. Fertlow can, can you zoom in with the laser disc or not? And I spoke too quickly, Your Honor. I'm not technically oriented. I'm going to go back to the, the photograph to zoom in. Back to the Elmo. Back to the Elmo. All right. If Mr. Fertlow could go to the, my left, and down a bit. I'm sorry, the other direction. Sorry. No, you're back fine on the left. <laughs> I want to focus in, if you would, please, on those two trays on the left side to begin with. See if we can read what's uh, written there. Doctor, what uh, are these two bins a part of? These are the uh, bins which store the uh, envelopes for obtaining <coughs> fingernail kits. Have you, in fact, brought with you a sample of one of these fingernail kits? Yes, I have brought an open uh, sample, and I also have an unopened sample in the box there. But I can show the open sample, which is easier to. If you have a sample that we can use as an exhibit, okay, is it me... in your box? Yes. Can I? Which box do you need? I think the first one which you have there. First I... one. All right. May I approach you? You may. Your Honor, uh, for the record, Dr. Lakshmanan has handed me uh, actually two sample kits, but I'm going to start with one, which appears to be labeled fingernail kit at the top Department of Coroner County of Los Angeles. May this kit and its contents, and on the back, by the way, for the record, it has a, a seal saying, warning, sealed evidence, do not tamper. May this be marked as Exhibit 304A? 304A. Well, may I approach again, Your Honor? You may. Doctor, excuse me, either counsel handling the witness may approach without leave of the court. Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, um, would you, holding it up, tell us what it is, take us through the process of how that kind of kit is used. Uh, the envelope itself has information which needs to be completed with reference to the case number, the name of the dissident, and also you have information on uh, what type of evidence has been collected in a particular person. So uh, it's got a seal here, and when the evidence has been collected, naturally another red seal is placed to secure the evidence which has been collected. And when you open, shall I open the envelope? If you would, please. And, for the and this is the envelope marked for fingernail kit, and th this envelope usually contains the fingernail uh, uh, scrapings also. Uh, and I'll explain what it is. For the record, Your Honor, uh, Dr. Lakshmanan has broken the white seal on the back of the envelope, and he appears to have removed, I can't see how many number of envelopes. There are about four envelopes here. One is for the right-hand nail clippings. And is so labeled, Doctor? Yes. And of course, every envelope has the coroner's case number. And is that the individualized number you identified previously uh, with respect to each of the decedents? Yes. Then. We have for the uh, right hand fingernail scrapings, same number and process. Then we have for the left hand fingernail clippings and left hand fingernail scrapings. And uh, there is a difference in the content of the envelopes. The scraping envelope also have what's called a birch stick. A, I'm sorry, birch? A birch stick, B-I-R-C-H, birch stick which is used to scrape the uh, nail bed after the clippings have been obtained. So this is a prepared kit that's available for someone like Ms. Radcliffe to take one out of the bin and with each decedent use that kit to collect scrapings and clippings? That's correct. And then what is uh, someone like Ms. Radcliffe supposed to do with, let's start with, scrapings are taken first? No, usually they take the clippings first 
You usually use a scissor because if you use a nail clipper, sometimes the nail will fly. So you use a scissor and you cut the nail, and after that, you do the scrapings of the nail base. And then what does uh, someone like Ms. Radcliffe do as far as collecting that material? The, uh, as I, I have to show you one of the, open one of the envelopes. I showed you the bird stick, and there's a bindle of paper which is available inside each envelope. Can you hold that up higher for everybody to see, doctor? And the bindle is usually opened, and the evidence is collected in a such a manner that it falls on the bindle uh, paper, and then it's uh, closed back and placed back in the envelope. So this way, uh, the evidence is secured. Is Ms. Radcliffe or whoever is to do this uh, supposed to wear gloves of some sort when performing the procedure? Yes. And then once there has been the collection made, what happens with these individual envelopes? They are uh, uh, sealed and then uh, dropped off in the uh, evidence drop box, which is available in the same room. I think we have a picture of that coming up uh, momentarily. If I could have that exhibit back, 304A, and now you're going to ask that uh, this second kit that Dr. Lakshmanan handed me that has the words decedent's hair kit and a similar appearing seal, may this be marked collectively as 304B as in boy? So marked. Doctor, would you basically take us through the same process you just did with the fingernail kit as to what this new exhibit is? This again has a pre-marked. Uh, uh, if you hold it up, pre-marked envelope for the particular evidence being collected. This is a dissident hair kit, and inside this envelope, I'm breaking the seal for this envelope. And each of the envelopes has the coroner's case number, the dissident's name. Uh, and when we open the uh, envelope, there are four other envelopes inside the main envelope. One is for facial hair, and the facial hair envelope has uh, separate bindles, each of them marked for eyelash, eyebrow, beard, and mustache if it's a male. Then there is a envelope for head hair. Hold them up again, please, doctor. Head hair. There's a envelope for chest hair, depending on what is collected, and arm hair. How is the hair collected from each of the areas from which hair will be collected? Basically, the hair is uh, plucked with the root so that you have the uh, root also available. Usually you collect uh, anywhere up to 100 hair, 100 hair samples from the head area and you collect hair from the front, back, and sides and top. And how does one uh, get the root out? You pluck them with a, either the, you can use a tweezer or you can also just pluck it. You can easily get it out. Is the investigator expected to wear gloves for this procedure? Yes. Now, doctor, what happens with the hairs once they've been collected? The same process. The evidence is placed in the main envelope, sealed, and dropped off in the drop box. If I could ask Mr. Maricolo to take the photograph down for just a moment. And incidentally, Your Honor, uh, for the record, let me write on the back of the uh, Exhibit 304A that designation. And on the back of uh, the Hair Kit 304B. Thank you. And if I could have Mr. Fertlow please put on the Elmo the Exhibit 304A. And perhaps I need to go to the eye doctor, but it looks a little out of focus to me. It is slightly. Either that or I really need to go to the eye doctor. Doctor, is there information here that is supposed to be completed by the person collecting the scrapings and clippings? Yes. And what, in essence, is to be done 
by someone like Ms. Radcliffe with respect to this form? Uh, all the evidence which is collected needs to be completed on the envelope. And in addition to filling out the case number and the dissident's name. And uh, I think just under the bold fingernail kit, there's a line where the decedent's name is to go? Yes. And to the right of that, my eyesight's getting better. To the right of that is the coroner's case number where it is to be placed? Yes, and also uh, you have uh, information which needs to be completed uh, with reference to what was collected, yes and no. And also you need to fill out whether the evidence was collected at the scene or at the Forensic Science Center, which is the coroner's office. And that's uh, basically um, 1104 North Mission Road? Yes. Next. And then the investigator signs it. Uh, there also appears in what is displayed here something underneath the area of by and date and time, something received in evidence room. What does that refer to? Uh, I had mentioned earlier the evidence is dropped in the drop box. There is an evidence custodian for the office who retrieves the evidence from the drop box uh, every day and transports the evidence to the evidence room where the ev all the evidence from all the cases are secured. And if anybody wants to retrieve the evidence, they go to the evidence custodian to get the evidence re uh, released to them. And let me ask Mr. Fairlow if he would please to put 304B up so we can see what uh, is the information to be completed on this particular kit. Doctor, in essence, is the procedure the same as you just identified? Yes. By the way, at the top, you see, I think we also saw it in the other one, file, DR number, and agency. What is that information to reflect? Basically, it refers to the law enforcement agency investigating a particular uh, crime, and they have a DR number. And in this particular case of uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman, uh, that would be the Los Angeles Police Department? Yes. And whatever their DR number would be? Yes. May I have just a moment with Mr. Fairlow, Your Honor? Your Honor, I, I've asked Mr. Fairlow if he would put on uh, the Elmo another photograph, which I'll ask to be marked as Exhibit uh, 305. And hopefully that he'll turn it the other attorney. Thank you, Mr. Fairlow. And actually, I would ask Mr. Fairlow if he would, please. Mr. Fairlow promised me that this was a very smooth procedure. If we could zoom in on the lower package on the left. And if we can focus that a little bit, thank you. Doctor, looking at uh, this particular aspect of photograph 305, are you familiar with what is shown here? Yes, this is the photograph of the original uh, envelope used uh, in collecting the fingernail evidence on Ms. Brown Simpson. Now, with respect to the writing that appears in agency file slash DR number, decedent's name, coroner's case number, and the check marks, and then the uh, either initials or signature by and the date and time. Uh, are you familiar with whose writing that is? Yes. Whose is that? Claudine Ratcliffe. And is she expected to complete this information uh, immediately after the collection of the particular material that is contained within this fingernail kit? Yes. And in this particular case, that time would be what, doctor? Uh, 13, 40 hours on June 13th. And that would be 1.40 in the afternoon? Yes. 
There also appears to be a check at Forensic Science Center. Is that also completed by Ms. Radcliffe? Yes. To reflect where the sample was taken? Yes. Now, Doctor, as you look at this particular kit, do you see any check mark in either a yes or no box <coughs> for the left and right hand fingernail scrapings? There's no check mark. Did you, on June 22nd of 1994, along with Dr. Bodden, who's uh, seated again in court with us, have an opportunity to review the contents of this particular envelope? Yes, I did. When you reviewed the contents of this envelope, what, if anything, did you find inside the envelope? We had uh, evidence of uh, both nail scrapings and clippings on Ms. Brown Simpson. And were the scrapings in individualized envelopes for left hand and right hand? Yes. Were they sealed in the manner you would expect them to be sealed? Yes. Does it appear from what you have found that Ms. Radcliffe simply failed to check those two boxes on this particular form? Sustained. Doctor, did there appear to be anything out of the ordinary with respect to what you saw on the interior of that kit that would cause you to have believed that there was a mistake with respect to the collection itself that was inside that envelope, those two packages that are not marked on the front of the envelope? Sustained. Doctor, from your experience and your knowledge of the practices of your office, did you find anything out of the ordinary with respect to the contents of this fingernail kit? There was nothing out of the ordinary in the contents, but the envelope uh, uh, failed to uh, demonstrate that fingernail clippings had been, uh, fingernail scrapings had been collected. In your opinion, was this a mistake on the part of Ms. Radcliffe not in marking the front of the envelope? Yes. And, Doctor, does this mistake by Ms. Radcliffe have any significance to you on any of the issues that you've reviewed with respect to things like cause of death, et cetera? Objection, irrelevant. Oh, no. None. And, Mr. Kurtlow, can you? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Could we go back to the original photograph for just a moment further? And the lower part of the envelope, please. This is, again, back to 305, the left-hand bottom kit and the lower portion. All right. Doctor, now I'd like Mr. Farrell to focus in on the part starting with evidence collected and down to the bottom of the envelope. And we've already covered the... Uh, signature of Ms. Radcliffe, and now I want to go to the received in evidence room by. Do you recognize a signature in the by box or line of that entry? Yes, I do. Whose signature is that? Mr. Steve Patino. Who is Mr. Patino? He was a student worker at that time in the evidence room. Keep your voice up, please. Doctor. He was a student worker in the evidence room at that time. And what would his responsibilities be, if any, with respect to handling uh, collected evidence such as this fingernail kit? He uh, would uh, retrieve it from the drop box and log it in the evidence room uh, and also uh, document this process in the evidence log sheet of the coroner's office. We're going to see the drop box and so forth later, but is Mr. Patino expected at the time that he collects this from the drop box to make an entry on the kit itself to show he has obtained possession of it? Yes. What time and date does this entry reflect? It reflects uh, June 15th, I think 7 o'clock in the morning. Doctor, is there anything uh, out of the ordinary of your regular custom and practice with respect to a kit being collected on the 13th at 1.40 in the afternoon, placed in the drop box, but not received by someone like Mr. Patino until the 15th? There's nothing out of the ordinary. Usually they pick up every morning, and uh, in this case they picked it up the 15th. It seems to be received on the 15th. You have to keep your voice up. Doctor. It has been received on the 15th. Okay, now that's a day and a half later. Is that unusual? It's not unusual. Underneath that received in is another set of pre-printed words delivered to by date and time. What is that intended to refer to? That, as I mentioned earlier, the evidence custodian is the one who releases evidence from the 
coroner's office. Everybody has to go there to re collect any evidence. Uh, and in this particular situation, that Deliver 2 is the name of the person whom this evidence was released uh, to by Mr. Patino on the 24th. And I think I read a name, uh, G, I think I-N-D-I-S, if I'm... Well, assume for the moment that someone named DeGrandis. Grandis. Is that a coroner employee? No. Now, if we go to the next line, by, do you recognize that signature? Uh, that is Mr. Patino. And then the entry for date and time that appears next to that, what does that refer to? That is the date and time the evidence was released from the coroner's office. Which would be in this case? June 24th, 94, uh, at 9.30 in the morning. Now, Doctor, there appear to be two entries below that series of entries you just referred to. What, if anything, do those two refer to? Uh, those entries were not made at our office. Once the uh, envelope is released, I don't have an idea who entered those, but probably the uh, LAPD. You did not, that is, your office did not retake or regain custody of this kit and its contents. Is that correct, once it was released? That's correct. Now, if uh, Mr. Ferretlow could move to the second photograph and focus in on the same area of that photograph we were just focusing in on Exhibit 305. Doctor, does this appear to be the back side of the envelope, the fingernail kit for Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson that you were just viewing in the previous photograph? Yes. Your Honor, may this be marked as, I believe we're at Exhibit 306, is it? 306. Now, Doctor, there appear to be, uh, it's kind of an American flag. We have a white, a uh, red, and a blue. Can you tell us uh, which, if any, of those are coroner materials? The original white, I already showed you, that is the seal which is broken when the envelope is opened. The red is uh, uh, a seal which is uh, placed after the evidence is collected. Placed by whom, Doctor? By the investigator when the uh, envelope is sealed back. So in this case, that would be Ms. Radcliffe? Yes. And is she expected to initial this in some fashion? Uh, yes. Do you see her initials somewhere? You have to speak up, doctor, so look first and speak perhaps afterwards. I can't see uh, <laughs> Doctor. Doctor, yeah. if you're going to speak, it's going to be very helpful if yeah. you'll speak into the microphone. So yeah. look first. There is an initial on the, uh, on the tag there, but I'm not sh sure whether it's her initial or it's just this uh, on the right side. I don't see an initial here. But she is expected to initial it. Is that correct? Yes. Now, doctor, and I think we're done with that particular photograph. And I've asked Mr. Farrellow to put another photograph on the board, on the Elmo, excuse me. And, Your Honor, may this be marked as Exhibit 307? Yes. Doctor, are you familiar with what is shown in this particular photograph? Yes. What is this? This is the hair kit of Ms. Brown Simpson <coughs> Nicole, uh, which was collected on June 13th, 1994. Uh, if Mr. Ferretlow could zoom in at the um, top portion, fine, that's great. Again, do you recognize the handwriting or printing that appears in the areas with LAPD and a number and underneath that decedent's name and coroner's case number? Yes. Whose is that? The, this is the handwriting of Ms. Claudine Ratcliffe. And there now, if Mr. Mr. Ferretlow can raise the photograph so we see a little further down on it and stop in this area. Doctor, there appear to be boxes uh, that have, I believe, X's on them. Do you see that? Yes. Who is expected to make those X's on this particular form? Ms. Ratcliffe. And in this particular case, what do those X's reflect? That certain types of hair was collected. What types of hair were collected? Uh, had uh, uh, Facial and arm hair was collected. And uh, the last entry that has no box checked, I can't quite make out. Can you tell us what that uh, would represent? Chest hair. 
Now, Doctor, we drop down to uh, just about the end of that white tape. There appears to be a signature, a date, and a time. Do you recognize that? Yes. Whose signature? Ms. Claudine Ratcliffe. And again, the time and date reflect what? Uh, June 13, 94, 13, 40 hours, which is 1.40 in the afternoon. Approximately when this material was collected? Yes. Sustained. Doctor, is she expected to put in the time approximately when this material was collected in these particular boxes? Yes. Now, the white tape, does that have any significance to you? There's white and red that we see along the side here. Uh, it's not from our office. It is uh, from the lab which was doing the examination of the evidence. It's not from the coroner's office, no. though? All right, if we'll drop to the bottom, now if perhaps uh, Mr. Farrell could raise the document again. What uh, are the entries that we are seeing here? The s similar entries which we saw in the other kit, Mr. Patino retrieved this evidence from the drop box on June 15th at 7, seven o'clock in the morning. And then underneath that? He delivered the evidence to the same uh, person, Mr. Grandis, on June 24th at 9.30. I'm sorry, keep your voice up, doctor. Mr. Grandis on June 24th uh, at 9.30 got the evidence from Mr. Patino. And the entries that appear below the ones you've just described are not made by anyone from the coroner's office, is that, that is correct? correct. I have another photograph that I'll ask Mr. Fertlow to please put in the Elmo and ask Your Honor that this be marked. I think we're up to 307. Yes. 308. 308. Doctor, does this appear to be the back of the envelope that was just previously up on the screen regarding the hair kit of Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. And the white seal that's running, hor I'm sorry, vertically in the center uh, top portion, is that a coroner seal? Yes. <coughs> what about the red uh, seals that form an X? What are those? Uh, those could be the, uh, 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 again, our uh, evidence. Uh, you see, this particular piece of evidence were retrieved by Claudine seal, and then again on the 22nd, we again examined them with Dr. Barden, and again the um, resealed by us. Keep your voice up, please. It's resealed by us. You resealed it, you and, uh, I'm sorry, after you and Dr. Barden had reviewed the contents of this envelope? Yes. But all of the seals that we're looking at in the center, the white and the two red, are Los Angeles County coroner seals of the envelope, is that correct? Yes. I have another photograph that I'll ask Mr. Fertlow to put on the Elmo and ask it to be marked 309, Your Honor. 309. Doctor, are you familiar with what is shown in this photograph? Yes, this is the evidence uh, envelope reflecting the hair kit collection on Mr. Ron Goldman. And if Mr. Fertlow can zoom in on the upper portion, Thank you. The entries that appear there for agency, DR number, decedent's name, and coroner's case number, do you recognize the writing? Yes. Who's writing? Claudine Ratcliffe. And again now, if we drop down a little bit, there appear to be a series of boxes which are checked. What, are that, what uh, do those entries reflect? Basically, collection of hair uh, from Mr. Ron Goldman, head hair, facial hair, and arm hair were collected. And in this case, there's also a no box checked, is that correct? Yes. To reflect what? Chest hair was not collected. And if Mr. Fairlow could drop down a bit. Now we're back at the, the evidence collected portion of the document. Do you recognize the entries that appear there? Yes. What do they reflect? Ms. Claudine Ratcliffe collected them at the Forensic Science Center June 13th and uh, uh, at 1440. Hours. And dropping down even further, 
There are some entries. Do you recognize who made those entries? Yes, uh, it was uh, received in the evidence room by Mr. Patino on June 15, 94, at 7 o'clock. And then even dropping down further, we have some more entries. What do they reflect? The evidence was released to Mr. Grandis by Mr. Patino on June 24, 94, at 9.30 in the morning. And again, there are some entries underneath the ones you've just referred to. Were those made by your personnel? No. And I've asked Mr. Fairlow to put another photograph on the board, or the Elmo. I'm used to board. Sorry, Your Honor. Uh, may this be marked as Exhibit 310? Yes, People's 310. Doctor, are you familiar with what's shown in this photograph? This is just a sealed envelope, the reverse side, so I The reverse side of the envelope you were just looking at? Yes. Please keep your voice up. Doctor, bas yes. basically with your answers regarding this envelope, the seals that we see, the white and the two red cross seals, be the same as your answers were for the back side of the earlier envelope? Yes. I wish to cut the feet out. I'm not sure that that's necessary, but out of an abundance of caution. I'd ask, Your Honor, that this photograph be marked. I think we're up to 311. 311. And if Mr. Farrell could zoom in just a little bit, so maybe we can read the writing, maybe center it just a bit. Thanks. Doctor, first of all, in photograph 311, and actually, if you could raise it just a little bit, please, Mr. Farrell, so we can see that blue. The blue uh, rectangular item in this photograph, Doctor, first of all, in general terms, what is that? This is the fingernail clippings which was taken on Ms. Simpson, uh, which was opened by Dr. Barden and myself uh, on June 22nd. And this is a photograph to reflect the contents of the envelope. And I was asking, actually, I think, doctor, on what this blue rectangular item is that the arrow is by at the moment. Uh, the blue rectangular is a measuring, uh, is a card which we use whenever we take a photograph in the coroner's office. It's got a built-in ruler, and you inscribe the coroner's case number and the date and the name of the photographer who takes the photograph. And it's always placed in any coroner's photograph. The numbers that we see both on the envelope and on the measuring card, 94-5136, is this the individualized number for the case of Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. And this type of blue measuring card is to be in every photograph that is taken as a part of a, any case that is being photographed? Yes. Doctor, the measuring um, aspect of this card, what is it? It's in inches and uh, the measuring uh, device usually has up to three inches. Now, doctor, if uh, Mr. Farrell could move the arrow to my left and uh, to the white piece of paper, and there appear to be a series of items on this white piece of paper, what are those items? Right-hand fingernail clippings did from you, Ms. Brown Simpson. Did you remove those clippings uh, when they were in that bindle with the bindle having been in the envelope that's seen in this photograph? We just opened and saw it. We didn't handle it. We closed it back. I have minutes of the meeting what we exactly did. Is it in the course of this examination that you found that there were um, scraping envelopes collected? Yes. And uh, I'd like to refer to my minutes, Your Honor. And, Your Honor, while uh, Dr. Lakshmanan is doing that, I'm asking Mr. Farrell to put another photograph up that I asked to be marked as 312. All
minutes in front of me. I'm sorry, Doctor. Have you had a chance to review whatever you needed to? <coughs> yes. And what does it refresh your memory about? These are the right-hand fingernail clippings which we viewed. And now in this photograph that's been marked as Exhibit 312, what is shown in this photograph? This is a close-up photograph of the nail clippings. As you and Dr. Bodden had an opportunity to examine them? Yes. I think we're done with that photograph then. And if we could go back to that we were looking at when we did a close-up uh, of the tray with respect to uh, fingernail kits. Doctor, uh, now inviting your attention, if Mr. Farrell could take the arrow to the top, the countertop uh, of the uh, area displayed here. Doctor, do you see some items on the countertop that are used by someone like Ms. Radcliffe with uh, the bodies as the bodies are brought into this room? Yes, this is the uh, fingerprint uh, kit which is uh, used to take fingerprints. And what kind of fingerprints are, would uh, someone be expected to take from a body when the body arrives at the uh, area that's shown in this photograph? We usually take all the fingers and also the palm prints. Did you find, doctor, once you uh, reviewed this case, that there had been a mistake made with respect to any of the fingerprinting or palm printing of either of the decedents? Nicole Brown Simpson or Mr. Goldman? Yes. What mistake or mistakes did you find were made? Uh, they took the, uh, in Nicole Brown Simpson, apparently only the right hand palm prints were taken, the left hand palm prints were not taken. Did you examine the card of the prints that were taken? No, I did not because they were already released, uh, but I have copies of the cards. Is there a separate card to reflect the left palm and the right palm? Uh, it's in the back of the fingerprint cards, actually. I, I'm, you have it in the back of the fingerprint cards. And did the copies of the cards that you have show some kind of entry in each side, that is for a left and a right? I don't I have to check the card copy. All right, could you refresh your memory if you would, please? Yes, I only have the front uh, copy. I don't have the back because it was released. The cards were released already, I think. To whom were the cards released? To LAPD. And uh, they are the ones who informed us that the palm prints were not taken on. Left hand was not available. Doctor, in your opinion, does the absence of a left palm print from Nicole Brown Simpson affect your ability to evaluate the issues that you have evaluated? No. Oh, you may no, answer. No, uh, no. I have another photograph, Your Honor. I asked to be marked as Exhibit 313. Doctor, are you familiar with what's shown in this photograph, 314? 313, excuse me. Yes. What is that? This is the area where the drop box is located, where after the evidence is collected from the dissidents, it is placed in this kind of drop box, and uh, an evidence log is maintained. And doctor, if Mr. Farrell could zoom in on that mailbox-like device, and... There appears to be some kind of brown envelope in about the middle. Do you see that? Yes. And now he's zoomed in where I think you can read something. What does that reflect? Uh, that is the uh, space where the evidence uh, log uh, uh, cards are placed 
after the evidence has been dropped off in the drop box. When you say the log cards are placed, is something to be completed by someone on that card? Yes. By whom? The investigator uh, on a particular case. Like Ms. Radcliffe? Yes. And is she expected when she drops this off to fill in what information? Uh, there are two log sheets here. One is the evidence log card which belongs to a particular case so we can have a chain of custody of the evidence. The other is there, there's a drop-off log sheet which is also available next to the drop box wherein it is indicated who dropped off what evidence in the drop-off box. And she is expected to complete both documents? Yes. What happens with the log card that is placed back in this envelope that's seen in this photograph 313? The, this evidence log card is retrieved by the evidence custodian who retrieves the evidence from the drop box. And what does the custodian, that would be Mr. Patino? Yes. What does he do with it when he retrieves it? He retrieves it and it is the uh, card which is used by him and information is completed as and when the evidence is released from the coroner's office. So there's a chain of custody for the evidence. And if you look at the log sheet, which uh, we will see later, uh, uh, you will have when the evidence was collected, when it was received in the evidence room, to whom it was released, etc. Is that document uh, completed in the ordinary course of business for the coroner's office by its employees? Yes. And are the entries expected to be made at or near the time of the events which are recorded? Yes. I have another photograph I'll ask Mr. Fertlow to um, put on the Elmo and ask that that be marked as 314, please, Your Honor. <coughs> now, Doctor, is this another view of the drop box? Yes. But we are now seeing uh, both the front portion of the mailbox and what appears to be the right side of the mailbox. Is that correct? Yes. There also appears to be a brown envelope of some sort on the right side. What is that all about? That is the uh, uh, place where the fingerprint cards are placed after the fingerprints have been obtained on a dissident. And that is to be placed by whom? The person collecting the fingerprints. In this case, who was that? Mr. Jacobo. And what happens to the card once it's placed there? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, retrieved by the uh, evidence custodian also. And that would be like a Mr. Patino? Yes. And what does Mr. Patino do with that once he collects it? He maintains the same information on the log sheet which I alluded to earlier so that we'll have a chain of custody of the fingerprint cards in the coroner's office. Is there anything else about uh, the process of the collection of the hair kits, the nail kits, and the deposit of those kits as collected that we have not covered that you feel should be brought out? It's important. You can see a lock there. Nobody else has access to that lock except the evidence custodian so that there is complete security of the evidence once it's dropped off in the lock box, and that is important. I'll ask Mr. Farrellow to put another photograph on. Ask that it be marked, Your Honor, as Exhibit 315. Mr. Lynch has uh, offered me a good suggestion. With that box, and you say it's got a lock, how does anybody get in to drop something off? No, that is, uh, it's like a mailbox on the upper part. You can drop in the evidence, but to retrieve it, you need to open it and retrieve it from the lower portion. And is it fair to say that the security that is provided would be the same as if one wanted to retrieve the letter that they inadvertently dropped in a mailbox? That's correct. Now let's see if we can go to this photograph that's up on the <coughs> Elmo, Exhibit 315. What are we looking at here, Doctor? This is the uh, area in the refrigerate, refrigerated room in the coroner's office where the bodies are placed uh, prior to autopsy. This is an area of the uh, refrigerated crypt space where the homicide uh, cases are kept. 
When you say crip space, you mentioned crip space before, and you mentioned spaces three and four for Ms. Brown Simpson, Mr. Goldman. Is this the area you're talking about? No, no, no. This is a, uh, the area where we keep all the homicide cases. The crip space, which was earmarked, is the space where the bodies are placed after the autopsy and before release so we can locate the remains at that point. Doctor, is this area secure in any fashion? Yes, I mean, the whole building is secure, and uh, this is a separate uh, uh, entry uh, area into the refrigerator. You see the door there? Uh, if, uh, can, uh, that's the, uh, it's an automatic door uh, entry to the refrigerated crypt space area, and the only people who have access are the employees of the coroner's office, the forensic attendants, and the technicians. We are looking from the inside towards the door that would lead to the outside of this yeah. area? Yes. Doctor, why do you have this area refrigerated? Because you're storing uh, uh, human remains so that uh, you prevent further deterioration of the body condition, which happens after death. Doctor, you've testified that the bodies were received at the Forensic Science Center on June 13th of 1994. Was any autopsy performed on either body on June 13th, 1994? No. Is that standard procedure? Yes, because uh, usually uh, it, the autopsies are performed the next day. Sometimes we do perform autopsies the same day, depending on our caseload. But generally, the autopsies are performed the following day or the day after, soon after the investigative information is available to the doctor. Did the bodies of Nicole Brown Simpson and Mr. Goldman come to be placed in this room sometime on the 13th of June, 1994? Yes. Had you examined either body prior to the time they were placed in this room? Yes, I did. When did you first see either body? Sometime in the midday of June 13th uh, when I was made aware of these two uh, deaths, and I met Ms. Claudine Ratcliffe, uh, and we went down together to look at the dissidents in the dissident processing room, which I had shown, which we had shown earlier on a photograph. The processing room is the fingernail kits, the hair kit area. Yes. When you saw, you saw both bodies? Yes, I did. Were they both clothed when you saw them? Yes. Did you examine them in any detailed fashion at that time? No, I just examined uh, briefly the uh, external front aspect of both the dissident. And at that point, uh, I <coughs> asked Ms. Ratcliffe whether a criminalist had been to the scene. And I had information that no criminalist had gone to the scene. So I made sure that our criminalist from our office uh, examines the dissidents, and I called the chief of laboratories, and Mr. Mahaney, who is our criminalist at our office, came to look at both the dissidents. I think we'll get into that a bit later. Did you do anything other than what you've described with respect to examining the bodies on the 13th? Yes, I also wanted to assign the cases uh, to a physician, and that is the day I uh, looked at my schedule, uh, uh, and I requested Dr. Golden to, these, uh, to do both autopsies. Doctor, take us through the process, if any, that you used in deciding to ask Dr. Golden to perform the autopsies in these two cases. Uh, I had to see who is the experienced pathologist we have who are available not only on the day these two dissidents were brought uh, to our office, which was June 13th, but also the day following and June 15th, because sometimes uh, an autopsy may take more time than necessary. And Golden, Dr. Golden was one of the physicians who was available all the three days as I saw in the schedule. And the other, as I told you earlier, I have 12 board certified forensic pathologists, and he was one of the pathologists who was available. Now, doctor, uh, is there a chief uh, under you 
who is uh, in charge of the forensic medicine division of the coroner's office. Yes. Who is that? Dr. Rogers. Would he be described as the number two man in your operation? In, yes. Is he board certified? Yes. Do you consider him to be a uh, experienced and competent forensic pathologist? Yes. Was he available for the three days you felt were necessary, the day that you were seeing the bodies, the 13th, and the two subsequent days? He was not. He was on medical leave. Was there any other forensic pathologist who you felt might be better suited for these particular cases? No, I consider all my forensic pathologists to be, uh, who are board certified as experienced and capable, but I do have three senior physicians who uh, also uh, do complex cases when the necessity arises, and uh, uh, all three of them were not working all three days. Who are the others if, do the three include Dr. Rogers? No. Who are the three you're talking about? Uh, Dr. Sherry, uh, Dr. Reby, and Dr. Carpenter. Why did you feel it was necessary that whoever was to be assigned the cases had to be there the 13th and the 14th? I think you explained why there may be a need to go over to the 15th, but why did you feel the need for the 13th? It's very important when you have uh, a homicide case that somebody sees the uh, uh, remains when they are clothed, when the evidence is being collected, and then uh, follow up with their autopsy, and then follow through the process of dictation and determining the final cause and manner of death. And none of these three were available for the three days that you described? Not all the three days, because one of them was off on Mondays, and the uh, other physician was off on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and the third physician was off on Wednesday. Uh, and furthermore, they also are the uh, administrative type of physicians who, uh, uh, who, who are called operation officers, which I mentioned on Friday, who determine the extent of examination and assign cases, and they do the examinations uh, in the office. That is, the cases which we don't autopsy, they do the examinations. Doctor, why didn't you do the autopsies? You're the top man there? That, that is a good question to ask, but I have other responsibilities being the chief uh, medical examiner coroner. I have numerous responsibilities. I was also doing the administrative function of Dr. Rogers. Did you see these as high publicity cases? Yes. Did you think that it might be beneficial to you personally to handle these cases? Sustained. Doctor, is there a book called Coroner to the Stars? Sustain. Doctor. Mr. Calvert, would this be a good place to take a break? We don't Anytime like you want, Your Honor. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, regular 1030 break. Please remember all my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Form any opinions about the case. Don't allow anybody to get, communicate with you. Don't conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you. And we'll take a break for 15 minutes. All right, Doctor, you can step down. Are all parties are again present. All right, Deputy McNair, let's have the jurors, please. Be joined by all the members of our jury panel. Dr. Lakshmanan is again on the witness stand undergoing direct examination by Mr. Kelberg. And Mr. Kalberg, you may resume with your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. I have another photograph for Mr. Ferretlow. And actually, before you put it on, Mr. Ferretlow, a couple more questions of Dr. Lakshman. And Doctor, uh, I was asking you why you did not consider performing the autopsies on these two cases. Were there any other reasons that you uh, took into account for deciding not to? As I told you, I have numerous responsibilities as a coroner for Los Angeles. I'm responsible for the quality of the reports which go on all the 6,000 autopsies we do, the other 5,000 examinations which we do. And I'm also available for other functions in the office, and it's all enumerated, uh, all my functions are enumerated in my curriculum vitae. But besides the point, I feel that uh, the compl different cases uh, have to be uh, experienced by different pathologists in my department, so they're all capable of doing uh, complex cases. 
Doctor, you've used this term again, complex cases. Did you consider each of these two cases to be a complex case? Uh, not in the type of uh, case itself, but the number of injuries they have. Tell us more how you distinguish between these two concepts. When you, when you refer to the case complex, complex, complexity may refer to the number of injuries a particular decision has. And complexity can also refer to a difficult medical case where there's been hospitalization and a lot of medical problems which had to be correlated with pathological findings. And uh, that would be a different type of complexity. Would you a child abuse case could be more complex than a case like this where you have injuries which are uh, uh, clearly observable. When you're talking about more complex in the sense that you mentioned child abuse cases and so forth, is that um, a thought process requiring a more experienced individual than maybe a younger forensic pathologist in your office? Well, it, it would be preferable for a more experienced person doing the case, but in our office we have all the board certified forensic pathologists and also fellows in training who do the cases, but they work under supervision of the experienced pathologist. So in a, what I'm trying to say is every, asp, every type of case can be handled by any, of one of my, any one of my pathologists with the assistance or without the assistance of another experienced pathologist. Would you consider the case of Nicole Brown Simpson from a forensic pathology standpoint to be a bread and butter type of case for a Los Angeles County deputy medical examiner? Yes. Why? Because this is a kind of uh, homicide case we see routinely in our office. In any given day, we have about uh, 10, 8 to 10 homicides cases being performed, and we have a significant number of them which have uh, sharp force injuries, blunt force injuries, or firearm injuries. And would the same uh, opinion apply with respect to the case of Mr. Goldman? Bread yes. and butter? Yes. For the same reasons? Yes. Now, if Mr. Ferretlow could uh, put on this photograph, and this, Your Honor, I'd ask to be marked as 316. All right, people 316. Doctor, are you familiar with what's shown in this photograph? Uh, that also shows the same uh, refrigerated crib space, but you're looking at it from the outside of the door. You saw the photograph from the inside. This is from the outside. And now if we could go to the uh, laser disc number 55, please. And doctor, what's, uh, and Your Honor, I'd ask that this be marked as 317. Equals 317. What is this that's shown in this photograph, Doctor? This is uh, another autopsy room in the coroner's office. Uh, this is a smaller room. And these have uh, crib spaces with doors which can be locked. And uh, what you're seeing is two doors uh, in which there are crib spaces available. And uh, this would give more security to the uh, bodies. Uh, uh, if the doors are locked. And in the normal process, uh, over the years, we use this crib space for uh, bodies which are decomposed or uh, skeletonized remains. And this I'm sorry, area. Skeletonized ske remains? Skeletonized, uh, partially skeletonized remains. And this area of the uh, 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 crib space in our office is, is reserved for these type of uh, dissidents. And is this crib space what you were referring to earlier, numbers three and four, or something else? No, number three and four was referred to the crib space in the uh, another area in the refrigerated crib space. Anything else about this photograph, doctor? Nothing else. If we could move to number 24, please. And I'd ask, Your Honor, this be 318? All right, 318. What is shown in this photograph, doctor? This is the area of the office where photographs are taken. Uh, this is the photo studio area of the office. Uh, and uh, the dissident's uh, clothing is removed. Uh, they are photographed before the clothing is removed and after the uh, uh, clothing is removed, body is washed. All the photographs are taken here. Let's start this process. Um, First of all, in the cases of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman, 
When is this process taking place? Uh, it took place on June 14th in the morning. And what is the process? Take us step by step. What is the process? The process is the photographer uh, uh, takes uh, uh, the remains to this uh, photo studio area. He makes a blue uh, photographic, uh, uh, you know, the blue card which we saw earlier that is completed for each dissident. And one of the uh, procedures in the coroner's office is to take a picture with the card and the ID band so you know you're taking the picture of that person and the number is also cross-checked. Then photographs are taken of the dissident with the clothing on in the condition they are seen at that time. Following this process, the photographer removes the clothing and uh, places them in the clothing rack, which you saw uh, earlier sometime. And the body is uh, washed and photographed with special attention to injuries. And one of the important steps in the photography would be to take a photograph of the injury so that the anatomical region can be identified. And then a close-up photograph is also taken so that the injury can be better documented. And this is one stage of the photography of a dissident uh, before autopsy. Is the medical examiner who's going to perform the autopsy expected to examine the body at the time the photographs are first being taken with the clothes on? Uh, usually the medical examiner will t examine the body before the uh, photographs are taken and sometimes during the uh, process itself, it depends. And in this particular situation, uh, Dr. Golden saw the bodies with me on the 13th. In the clothed condition? Yes. Now, was anything done to the bodies between the 13th and the 14th when they are going to be photographed clothed? Uh, yes. I told you that Mr. Mahaney, our criminalist, saw the remains along with Ms. Claudine Ratliff to see whether any other evidence needs to be collected. And I think, uh, not I think, on Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson, he collected blood stains which were found in the right lower extremity, which is the thigh and calf area. And he collected that as physical evidence, and that was submitted on the 13th. And he examined the bodies with Ms. Claudine Ratcliffe. I was also present at the time uh, before he collected the evidence, uh, rather. And that process also took place in addition to the nail collection, the hair collection, the fingerprint card processing. And this all happened on the 13th. Uh, Dr. Golden and I looked at the bodies on the 13th. And then Dr. Golden did the autopsies on the 14th. And uh, the photographic process took place on the 14th of June, 1994. Incident, and I'm sorry. That's, I stopped. In selecting Dr. Golden to perform these two autopsies, had you become familiar with Dr. Golden's performance in any other high publicity double homicides? Yes, uh, he did the uh, Menendez uh, uh, dissidents who died, and uh, it was a double murder. And he has been in the office for uh, 15, 14 years, as I mentioned earlier. He's one of our experienced uh, pathologists who has uh, done many demanding complex cases for the coroner's office. As I told you, he has done over 5,000 cases. He always handles them uh, in a consistent uh, uh, manner. and. Uh, to answer your question, he had handled other high-profile complex cases before. As of the 14th, 13th of June, actually, 1994, had you been aware of any cases in which Dr. Golden had been the forensic pathologist in which he had made what you believe to be a major mistake in the course of his duties as a forensic pathologist autopsying a body? Not that I was aware of. Subsequent to your involvement in this case, have you become aware of several such cases? Yes. And we're going to get into that later. But at the time you assigned Dr. Golden, were you aware of any such problems? No. Now, Doctor, uh, 
in going through this process, the bodies are photographed clothed first, and then you said the clothing is removed by the photographer. Is that correct? Yes. Are the bodies then re-photographed basically in the same place, in the same position, with the clothing removed? Uh, no. What is the next step? Uh, the the uh, correction that photography may have taken place, but also the body is washed and then photographed. Why do you wash the body? Because when you have blood stains on the body from injuries, they obscure the details of the injury. The purpose of the photography is to document the injuries so that there's a permanent documentation of the injuries uh, in a manner that can be easily evaluated by any qualified uh, professional forensic pathologist uh, to uh, make uh, an interpretation of the injury pattern seen. So if you don't wash the bodies, one, you will miss injuries. Number two, you won't have a proper documentation because when you have blood staining which are dried up, uh, it will cause uh, uh, problems in interpretation. What is used to wash the bodies? They use soap and uh, water and uh, uh, also uh, 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 the sponge, soft sponge, so that the blood staining can be removed.